The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Yo, buddy. Good morning. morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing this lovely morning? Good, man. Good. It was a, it was a little slow for me. We had, we had a late night last night. We went to a LCD sound system last night. They were playing. Is that like a concert? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're good. Really good. What kind of music are you into? Well, LCD sound system is like, uh, like electronic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They're, cool. They're from like the early 2000s. Really good. I was actually supposed to meet a, a Monero a Monero friend, but he didn't make it up. He had some car issues on the way up. Huh. I went uh, to D- a, a restaurant last night. His name D Martian. He's pe- people should know him. He's jumped on this show a few times. He's a big LCD sound system guy, but he didn't make it. Oh, up cool. Actually. Yeah, you know, he seems like the kind of guy that would be uh, into that kind of music. Yeah, we went too. like I guess a year ago six months ago together first time we had a blast so they were playing again and he was he was trying to come up but he didn't make it but yeah he's definitely that that type of guy he's, he's a big fan <laughs> but what cool. happened for you last night uh, i went to a restaurant last night i was gonna say that um it's funny here in mexico you go to to like a nice restaurant and they're playing like club music like almost club music uh, like the whole time, like you think, okay, we're going to go to a nice fancy dinner. And then it's just like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like okay, well, sure. Yeah, I remember uh, being in uh, Tulum and like every restaurant we went to every night was like, it was just club music. Yeah. That kind of reminds me, we, could, we go to Puerto Rico quite a bit because Sunita's family's from Puerto Rico. So we were there on Easter during Easter. So they're, they're all, they're also, they're, you know, very, very Catholic there. Uh, but they also have that that party element that doesn't go away no matter what. So we were on the <laughs> <laughs> the beach on Easter, and it was like everyone who was like the speaker to person ratio has to be the the the, the, the of highest density of anywhere on the on the you know in the world. Like you take one step, and it's like you it's like everybody's a DJ on the beach. They just like like have their huge speaker sets. They're all rocking out. Boats pull it up with their, with their speaker systems. It's uh. It's fun. It gets a it gets a little exhausting now. <laughs> gets a little. It's a little much. Have you have you ever heard of the decentralized dance party? I did. Yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, these guys would carry around like a small FM transmitter, and then they would hand out radios, and so like they would just go randomly to to different crowds, like different places in the city, like in the middle of day, like in the middle of a work day, and uh, yeah, they'll just like hand out radios and get everyone like dancing and partying for. You know, whatever time period people were around waiting for the subway, whatever. But uh, I thought it was a yeah, cool the, idea. Pretty interesting. Yeah, the guy who runs it, I think he was on a he was on a narco poco when I was uh, interviewed on there, or it was uh, the conference, but it was during like 2020 during like well, during the lockdown. They did a remote thing. I don't know if it was huh. narco poco. It was related to it. That's um, where I met him, actually. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah, yeah. That's where I've I've discovered him as well. All right, man. So how we doing in, in price? Uh, try try to keep it somewhat short since I've been blabbing all morning. We're already like uh, <laughs> okay, thirty minutes. Yeah, um, so uh, I mean, Monero price has been hmm, not really too much has changed. We kind of took a dip. Um, you can see that's the weekly chart. We uh, we dipped down below basically the uh, really kind of the the drop deadline that the the line that we really wanted to hold. Um, that's kind of depressing, kind of sad. Um, that's kind of basically what happened over the past week, Monero, uh, and the rest of crypto markets kind of continued to bleed out. So at this point, we're in terms of Monero USD, we're firmly inside of the uh, back inside of this bear market um, sort of channel down here. Then there's no reason to say that that has to that that has to continue. Um, we're seeing some of these kind of uh, you know these wicks here. Uh, you see some wicks down there. It, it's possible, right, that that we could uh, that these wicks could be a sign of some temporary bottom or trying to form a temporary bottom. Perhaps it takes another few weeks. Um, looking at this chart right now, it does kind of strike me how we get these crazy big wicks to the downside uh, midweek, but I don't really see hardly any of them to the upside. I guess we got one right there, but eh, you know, I, I look at that and you know, I want to, I want to start talking crazy conspiracies and shit, but you know, we'll avoid that for today. <laughs> this is uh, Monero Bitcoin right here. And we're basically in this kind of downward channel. We're coming up on 
um, to me, what's what's a very important support line. Oh, let's go to the weekly, right? So, right, that's kind of like our lifetime triangle support line. Um, like we talked about a couple months ago, it's it's totally unsurprising that we're inside this little channel here. Um, was that? Did you say something, Doug? Did you have something for me here? Yeah. No. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I thought I heard you say something. Uh, okay. So, I mean, with this chart, you know, there's there's really probably not much exciting to expect to happen here. Maybe there's a chance we kind of form a bottom, kind of come back up eventually. Uh, but you know, we're looking here at the next month, two months, maybe even three months. Um, just kind of hanging out, boring action inside that channel. Uh, there's there's not much happening with the uh, with the divergences, kind of just hovering around that zero point. Uh, when we saw the big crash recently, we we saw the divergences go to the negative side, which almost always happens. Very common whenever Monero price crashes, um, Binance and KuCoin and all those other lovely exchanges love to. Um, just do a bunch of volume down there at negative prices to Kraken, which I think is part of the reason it, it kind of explains somewhat these big wicks down. Um, you know, we've talked about this before where it seems like they try to hit Monero harder than the other coins. Uh, so let's go take a look at, actually, let's let's stop for a moment and let's talk about um, some of the fundamental things that happened this week. So the we had the Fed meeting, the, we had a FOMC meeting this week. It wasn't really, to me, it wasn't really a factor there was a little bit of volatility around that of trading around that time frame, but the Fed didn't say anything that was surprising. They it, it really, I, I tried to watch the meeting. I got through about half of it, and I said, "Wow, this is boring. These guys are just answering, asking the same questions over and over again." Um, the Fed didn't raise rates. This was like the first time that they haven't raised rates, and I think ten months now. So, um, but it, the market expected it. So you think, "Oh, the Fed, you know, is going to pause and no rate hike, and the market should pump now." It's like, well, the markets have kind of already pumped quite a lot um, in terms like of the Nasdaq and the S and P. You know, we're, we're basically as we talked about last week. For example, here's the Nasdaq uh, sitting at a very important resistance point. It was basically the very first peak after coming off the, the all-time highs last year, or, or sorry, the all-time highs in 2021. So the NASDAQ is sitting there. Um, as we talked about last week, we're looking at standard deviations. That's what this blue line is here, Bollinger Band standard deviations. There's a whole bunch of clusters of standard deviations from moving standard deviations from different timeframes that are all sitting right there. To me, this is a spot to look at the NASDAQ um, to take a pause to at least experience some resistance. Um, we're also looking at the S&P hitting some of those same levels. Uh, this line right here to me is kind of important. Uh, I wouldn't expect the S&P or the NASDAQ or stock markets to to really push much higher than this, uh, much higher than they've already gone. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at the inflation numbers because those also came out this week. And we're actually seeing good movement here. Like this is what we want to see. We're, we're almost like... A, I kind of feel like we've we've moved past this peak. We're in the optimistic portion now that inflation will actually get under control. Um, I mean, you know, as compared to what it was for the past couple of years, inflation is always there. It's always going up. It'll it's always out of control. The government's always, you know, a piece of shit. But, um, you know, they'll just be like regular pieces of shit instead of uh, how bad they've been the past couple of years. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, that's one way of framing it. it. But but the point is that we saw the CPI drop um, now down to 4%, which is like, that's, that's really good. Um, the producer price index is, is basically back. I mean, it, the, the blue line here is back in trend with the past couple decades or longer. Um, the orange line here is the core inflation rate. Uh, so that's like all inflation minus food and energy. Um, that is more sticky. Again, rents are still a problem. Um, a lot of that is the labor market combined with the housing market. So um, this is definitely more sticky. Let's go back just a little bit and take a just to get a historical perspective of where we are on inflation, generally speaking. So you can see that this time frame right here is the 1990s. Uh, you know, a lot of growth, a lot of stock market growth, a lot of technology growth. And then even after, um, you know, for the past two decades since 2000, this is where inflation has been the official numbers. The, the numbers have been in this zone right here. So that's really where we want to get back to think that we could just get back to some like normal steady state, you know, growth, 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 um, and not have like crazy times with, uh, 
with the whole um, pandemic stuff and money printing craziness. So anyways, the point is that CPI is finally getting back into trend. You can see CPI down here. It's, it's at the high level of the trend. The CPI is actually very close to back into trend. Um, the core inflation right here is still high, right? We, we, really, um, we really need to get back down to this level, something like 2%. Um, that's where core inflation has been for a long time. So <clears throat> we're, we're, we're not there yet. We're on the positive end of that. that. That It gives us the hope that some kind of normalization can return. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the government's still going to have to be careful with this. Um, we also had the debt ceiling was resolved, at least for a while. So there's going to be like another cool million uh, heading down the pipe there. And there's kind of a question over where it comes from. There's a whole bunch of money in uh, in the reverse repo markets. Um, you can see that that the reverse repos are, are kind of taking a dip here. They've, they've fallen out of this triangle. Um, I'm not sure how relevant this chart is for us anymore uh, in, t in terms of like crypto prices or even in terms of stock market prices. It's probably still a little bit relevant because stocks have been kind of continuing to make their way up over the past uh, couple weeks uh, as as the reverse repos have dropped. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, we, you know, I, I do keep an eye on that chart. It's I'm not sure how relevant it is at the moment. Dollar index um, is basically just kind of flat. Uh, as we had talked about a couple weeks ago, you know, we, it felt like we were reaching some uh, an inflection point there in terms of um, like, or sorry, a convergence of resistances. And sure enough, that's played out. We've kind of come down at this particular moment. We're sitting at some standard deviation lines. And I'm going to show you guys some really cool charts probably next week, um, maybe in two weeks. Um, but when I talk about these standard deviations and these statistical levels, it'll make more sense with these charts I'm going to show you. But basically, the dollar is starting to hit some uh, long term standard deviations that were formed uh, in large part by. By, uh, its fall from from the heights up there. So, anyways, uh, what I'm saying is that this looks like a, a spot for the dollar to maybe try and um, try and form a bottom here. It could take some time. Overall, the markets to me look flat. They look blah. I'm not convinced necessarily that they're going to do one thing or another. Um, it's possible that we've entered a period of just kind of flat sideways stagnation. Um, this right here is the Bitcoin and Ethereum chart. I did want to take a little bit of a look at volume and show you guys, let's go to the daily. So this is uh, the moving average of volume. It's the five day, let's go to the weekly. All right, there we go. This is a one week moving average of volume. You can see that volume has basically been dropping off ever since um, price has been coming up. So I'm not necessarily sure if that's if that's a good sign. It, probably a lot of it is related to the attacks going on in crypto in general and the exchanges and the, the cutting off of a lot of the banking access. So that, that probably has something to do with it. In general, um, overall, I like the Bitcoin plus ETH market cap chart. It feels like a cleaner chart to me. So for example, we've got, um, this was our August peak right there. That's where these two uh, horizontal lines come from. Uh, you can see that 2021, that was the summer low. And then this was kind of like the last stop before things crashed crazy in 2022 in, uh, in June. So that's what those horizontal lines are, just so that you can have some reference. Um, they're not, you know, they, they are significant. In this case, these horizontal lines are important for, um, you can see they kind of acted as a port for price for a while. Now we're on the negative side of that. Overall, um, you know, like the fat lady hasn't sung on this, uh, on a potential uh, for us to continue going to the upside with crypto overall, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, and and other stuff. We're still inside of the broader structure, right? There's kind of like this this um, wedge structure, or sorry, broadening structure uh, happening here. We found some support right at that spot. So, um, and then overall, Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are just kind of like following this channel down. You might want to try and say that this is a bullish flag. You know, we came up, and then uh, okay, this is a this is a bullish flag that will eventually break to the upside. Um, I, I'm not really sure what I think about it. Um, to, in terms of like how to play this, how to think about these markets, um, I wanted to to make a comment today about um, you have your hodl and your trading stack, and then personally for my trading stack, there's the long term trades and there's the short term trades. So I regard Monero as basically my hodl, um, and then on my trading stack, as I as I mentioned in the past couple of weeks, I've been exiting positions, and I should have specified. I mean, I've been exiting my short term positions. I'm still holding some of those longer term positions because, I mean, like I said, the fat lady hasn't sung here. We're still largely inside the structure. There is the potential for us to go back to the upside. It's just that there's so much uncertainty with the markets. One thing that's important to think about is that despite all of the bad news and everything that's happened, 
um, crypto prices, Bitcoin and Ethereum in particular, have managed to to hold on pretty well. We haven't seen like even this March crash that happened with the banking crisis or the the miniature banking crisis or whatever we want to call it. We haven't seen that kind of crazy drop, um, even with all the attacks on crypto. So there there is a good case to be made here that there is potential to try and break out of this thing to the upside. I would like to see this thing happen, unfold in real time. I would love to, um, you know, to be able to get on here with you guys or or uh, on Twitter and then say, hey, you know, these charts are starting to break to the upside. Um, but in terms of like short term plays for me personally, it's there's not enough clarity on the markets or where it's going. Um, and then maybe the last thing that I'll say here today is that in terms of Bitcoin dominance, in terms of where the markets um, are going to go for the short term and the long term. Bitcoin dominance continues to make breaks to the upside. And on the short term, this is something that we should expect to probably continue. Um, this is in large part driven by the attacks of the SEC. Um, there, right? There's a lot of uncertainty over, like, like Gensler couldn't even say in front of Congress whether he thinks ETH is a security or not. Even though the CFTC says it's not, uh, Gensler might think it is. And, and again, it's just about clarity. It's, I'm not trying to make an argument about whether ETH is or is not a security at this exact moment. But the point is that all of these coins are now in question in limbo over whether they are not securities. So Bitcoin is a big recipient of transfers of funds um, as a result of that. People don't want to be in those coins. They might get attacked. They're afraid. They're fearful, etc. So Bitcoin dominance is going to experience and likely to continue experiencing positive effects from this on the short term. However, there's a broader thesis emerging here. And once the, the idea is that, okay, crypto is under attack right now. Crypto might also be under quote unquote attack, right? This could be just like a big setup by, by the cabal on the inside to, to sort of like create the cycle, to create the thing, the impetus that will be needed for the next bull market. But what I want to, where I'm going here with this is that at some point, it's going to start to become more clear how these these attacks are going to play out, whether or not the SEC can actually make a good case in court. We're going to get a pre-glimpse of that. We'll get like a premonition of how that might play out when we see the Ripple case continue. Um, because if the SEC fails to, to win in that Ripple case, then that's going to provide a lot of um, a precedent for the other cases and lawsuits that they're bringing. By this time next year, and especially by maybe the end of 2024, the beginning of 2025, so one to two years from now, we should have some significant level of clarity over um, over what's happening. Right now, there there's still a lot up in the air. Probably Congress, combined with the presidency, they're, they're you know Democrat versus Republican. Sorry, not in that order. The Biden Democratic presidency versus the Republican Congress. They're probably not going to pass any like regulations, laws, legislature, you know, uh, legislative clarity. Um, but the courts might give us some clarity over the next year and a half. We're going to get things like discovery. We're going to see if um, Binance gets an injunction against its assets to be frozen. We're going to start to see maybe like some summary judgment motions. Things will start to become more clear. And the thesis is that once that clarity starts to appear on the horizon in one to one and a half, maybe two years, that could be the impetus that drives the next bull market um, that, that continues the four year cycle. So, um, you know, I think I think that's where things are headed for now. Expect Bitcoin dominance to rise for now. Uh, again, things are just kind of like wishy washy. We could experience a, a time a time period over the next months of just stagnation. Uh, we kind of had crypto stagnation. I think stocks could be following that soon. I'm not exactly top calling in the stock market yet, but I'm I'm feeling close. Uh, I'm feeling like there's that potential. So we'll we'll just have to keep a, a track of all the macro signs and um, hopefully you know hopefully we can. Uh, we can get some good clarity on where the markets are going and uh, maybe make some plays here. Um, like I said, for now, you know, to, just just be careful. Be ready um, to, to go either way. Right. Be ready for the market to go either way. Um, don't be taking massive risks uh, and, uh, you know, keep your head on a swivel. So that's all I got for you guys today. Did you mention the uh, sorry, I, I phased out a little bit because I was doing something on my phone trying to tweet something. Uh, did you mention the the BlackRock thing? Oh, uh, no, I didn't. So. Um, yeah, BlackRock, and this is probably a little bit of clarity here is important. So BlackRock filed for a Bitcoin trust. If if you look at their filing, it says trust on it. So it's it's not an ETF, at least I don't think it's an ETF. I haven't dug down into those details enough. But yeah, they're basically filing to have a Bitcoin trust, much like Grayscale does, except for their trust will be able to remove Bitcoin out of the trust when people sell. So they, they shouldn't, hopefully they shouldn't have the kind of... Um, 
uh, divergence to the net asset value that Grayscale does, right? So Grayscale, you can only put Bitcoin into Grayscale. So they, they have all this Bitcoin, they hold it in trust, they have a net asset value on the basis of how much those Bitcoin are worth, but then it trades on the stock market at a different value. Right now it's trading like minus 50%. Maybe it's only minus 40%, I haven't checked lately. Um, and that's because Grayscale can't remove Bitcoin from that trust. Um, so BlackRock has filed to do their own thing, much like Grayscale, except for they will they will be able to remove Bitcoin from that trust. Um, I, I think the idea is that they're going to apply for an ETF um, if they get approved for this trust. I think, you know, I mean, I think everybody can see how obvious this is. BlackRock uses, they've got USDC, they've got their stable coins, they have treasuries. They are like the blessed, holy, sanctified, you know, big player on Wall Street, whatever. And now they're going to have their Bitcoin ETF. Um, that will probably help Bitcoin dominance, right? That that attention on Bitcoin, that's going to help Bitcoin dominance. Um, it, it's also kind of a little like um, silver lining for the crypto industry as a whole in the sense that okay, BlackRock is making new investments into crypto. Obviously, they don't think the show is over. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it seems kind of obvious, like, okay, well, they're, you know, they're trying to get their foot in the door. Is BlackRock now going to get approved for an ETF where everybody else got denied? Is this whole attack on crypto a quote-unquote attack on crypto just so that they can change out the crypto, the existing crypto cabal for their own crypto cabal, right? Are they trying to cartelize the, uh, the crypto industry? Um, who knows, man, like they, these, like these kinds of power plays are just, they, they happen all the time. Uh, you know, and people like they make alliances and deals and then they, they backstab each other. Like I could only speculate on what's really happening behind the scenes, but I think there are power plays happening. So. Yeah, they're, they're moving in. Uh, it's interesting, right? It's, it's BlackRock. So, uh, what do you, do you think the ET, I mean, it's obviously the big question nobody knows, but do you think it's. Would you vote ETF likely does get approved or doesn't get approved for BlackRock? Uh, Tough one, right? I, I mean, would BlackRock, say... Like, if, if anybody can get something approved, right? I feel like it'd be those guys. I'd say they have the the best chance, right, of making it happen. Um, in turn, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't really have, like... I'd, I'd say 50-50, but I just say that because I don't know. There's probably more information out there. If I really, like, spent the next week studying it, maybe I could give you a better mm. a better opinion on whether they get approved or not. It's just that right now I, I feel like, you know, everyone's in bed with everyone and like there, there's these power plays going on. I don't even know if I think that Gensler is actually trying to attack crypto. Uh, he said a lot of good things about crypto when he was at MIT. He was like three quarters of it are not securities. He talked good about Algorand like and now he's like, you're all securities. Like, OK, bro, did you really like were you lying then or are you lying now? Are you yeah, really I mean, like in bed with the crypto industry? Like, who knows? At the end of the day, these guys are politicians, too. Right. So exactly. Maybe can't believe a word they say there. you can just chalk it down to that yeah they, they they have they have no i mean 99 percent of them have no like guiding values they're just trying to stay alive <laughs> yeah self-preservation I mean, and, and the, trying to gain as much power as they can the trader in me the the ngu you know the get rich quick guy wants um wants to believe that these guys are they're basically trying to fabricate, manufacture the next impetus for the next bull market. And to do that, they have to kind of like punch crypto in the nuts right now, you know, so that they can stand them up later and be like, oh, you took that shot pretty good. And then, uh, you know, get the regulatory clarity done and then say, hey, it's good. We're like, right. we know what to do. And all the corporations are here now. 2025, four year cycle. Let's go. I think there's a good case to be made that some of this is just theater, political theater, and they're manufacturing the ability to run the next bull market. So that. That could be what's happening. Good theory, good theory. And then I don't know if you mentioned the interest rates. So I know they, they pause. Do you think we're like very much on the on the downswing now with those? Like it's it's gonna it's gonna truly pivot and interest rates are gonna start to start to drop. I um I don't think they're gonna pivot and drop, but they are gonna pause. So the Federal Reserve decided for the first time in 10 months to pause their interest rate hikes. Um and they said they're they're going to need to do two more this year. We'll see if those two more happen or not. Uh, there's some question over with the debt ceiling. So the debt ceiling got quote unquote resolved. Um, they've got another trillion dollars coming down the pipe here. Um, there's a bit of a question over where they're going to get that money from. Who's going to buy the treasuries, right? Because they, they've got to replace old treasuries with new treasuries. Um, so they're, they, there's a bit of a question in that regard. Um, if the government has to print all this extra money. Like, do they really want higher interest rates for that? I don't know. 
I doubt that we see a pivot. Um, that that doesn't make sense for them to pivot. They've like just barely got on the positive, optimistic side of controlling inflation. So pivoting and dropping interest rates right here seems like probably kind of a bad idea. But um, we'll have to see. To me, like the real crisis isn't here yet. If there's going to be a big crisis um, that needs to be addressed, I think we're still a few months away from that. I would like to see how the end of the year plays out. Um, I kind of like, and I don't necessarily have great reasoning for it, but my intuition is something like the end of the year has the potential for us to actually see another big drop to the downside where crypto and stocks go back, maybe not lower lows, but they go back near those lows. Um, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. I, I don't think the federal reserve is going to pivot to the downside. It's so far they've done what they've said they're going to do, which is um, they've made the raises that they've said they're going to make. So I would expect at least one more interest rate hike um, this year. So I think they've got a meeting in July and then they won't meet again after that until September. So yeah, we'll just have to see, man. And an overall larger trend. Uh, we got, we got to be near the, if not at the top, near the top for interest rates. And then, it, and then do you think then we would, you know, the trend would be down over the next, whatever, couple of years. I think they want to hold interest rates as high as they can for as long as they can, um, without breaking the economy entirely. So, um, one thing that's happened recently that that is actually good to see. So you can see that yellow line right there. That's the one year rate. And then the gray lines are the six and three months. You'll notice that before all the major crashes, um, basically the federal funds rate was above almost everything. Like everything was below the federal funds rate right here just before 2020. Um, again, in 2008, the Fed funds rate was above everything, right? Everything else was below the Fed funds rate. So I mean, I, I do some, I do see some stability here still, um, and I do think that the Federal Reserve will want to hold these rates here. Maybe even take a little bump up. They'll want to hold that for as long as they can, with the goal of of trying to get inflation down. Um, I, I genuinely don't believe that they're trying to crash the system. I genuinely don't think that they're they're going to be like, okay, kill the dollar so we can replace it with a CBDC. I don't think that serves their power interests. I think it's more like boil the frog for now. It's boil the frog one degree at a time. People to like they still have their memory of like all the crap that went down and the willingness to resist it after the um, the events of the past few years. Let's just say. So I don't think that they can really quite get away with um, some other kind of like major crisis and emergency. I think they have to like go back to you know, slowly, incrementally, oh, we've got these cool CBDCs now. You don't have to use them, but, you know, they're there for you if you need them. Um, so, but I mean, what they really need to do to, to, to get things under control is get this fucking inflation back down here um, to, to like steady state. So that's, that's where I see things in that regard. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, man. Sure thing. <sighs> All right. Let's uh, keep it moving. Body, thank you so much, man. Stick around if you can. All right, brother. Yeah, Talk to you later. Good. Thanks, buddy.